This is Mark Bell from Super Training Gym. Super Training Gym, the strongest gym in the West. And today, I'm going to throw down with Mark Lobliner. We're going to be hitting up some bench pressing. But before we do that, we're going to take a shot to the dome. We're going to hit up some Mon Bullet. This is my seventh one today. Taking some Mind Bullet, washing her down with some caffeine. Yep. Oh, thank you, sir. Yep. So I shot a video with Mark um, probably about four years ago. Yes. Yeah, about four years ago. And it was, um, it was really awesome because we were going heavy at the time. You were powerlifting. I was four years younger. I was a little chubbier. Yeah. Yeah. So it did really well. I still get a lot of people talking about that video. So why not make it even better and answer even more questions, right? I love it. That's, that's what we're going to get to today. And if you are watching live, please ask questions because we're going to have the ability to uh, interact with you. But we're just going to go back and forth. I'm going to share some principles with Mark. He is already aware of how to bench press. We did that video long ago, and plus he's rubbed elbows with some of the best in the industry. But I'm going to also ask him some questions about how he likes to utilize the bench press uh, in some of his training and how he likes to bench specifically to try to gain mass for bodybuilding and stuff like that. So we're going to get warmed up and we're going to get going. All right, first couple things here on the bench press is like I always like to have a routine when it comes to this kind of thing. Um, and part of the routine includes even just sitting down. So I sit down the same way every time. I lay back the same way every time. I put my legs down the same way every time. As I go through this bench, uh, Mark, if you would, just you know, maybe ask some questions about maybe what it is that I'm doing, and I'll start to line up on the bench. You got it. So benching for powerlifting and bodybuilding, a bench press is a bench press. You always got to be careful when you bench press. So the thing is, get down. Now, your butt's supposed to be on the bench at all times. All right. And then you want your scapula retracted. I believe you're doing that right now. Yep. Retracting. See how we, what that means is you bring your shoulder blades together. Pretend that somebody puts their finger right between your shoulder blades. That's a good cue. Basically this. So you're bringing your shoulder blades together activating the lats. The lats are a huge part of the bench press. If you were to feel this right now, oh, that feels so good. Okay, if you feel that right now, his lats are engaged and he has not even started the lift. And if you notice, his back is off the bench, but his butt's on. So you can see this and that actually helps create the base. Quads are tense. A lot of people forget that your legs are a huge part of the bench press. So you kind of want to drive into the ground, tense your legs. So this is all, see people squirming around on the bench press, like wiggling around. You shouldn't be wiggling around. Comes down. If you notice, elbows are in. By keeping the elbows in, it's decreasing the risk right in here. That's where pecs tear. So keeping the elbows in, and I'll give you a cue for that. When I actually lay down here to do my set, of how I do it. And I do it a little bit differently because, again, bodybuilders, I'm generally not going to do as much of an arc. And I'm going to show you a couple differences in bodybuilders powerlifting. So, you, know, you got to keep in mind there's, there's a right way to bench press for maximum muscle tension. And there's a right way to bench press for powerlifting. And sometimes they're a little different. So, he might have a few different ways that he uh, likes to do these. So, one thing I do to get my grip right is I kind of do this come in and for me that's going to be about pinky on the hash mark see this hash mark right here so I come in I get my base I pull up and I come down now I have my feet my I have my weight on my toes similar action with as Mark has lower back but I have my scapula retracted I'm tensing up my quads are flexed so 
so my quads are flexing like my underpants. Wow, nice panties. Yeah, I wore them for you, man. I usually don't wear them at all. So elbows are in. Now, you'll see a lot of people do a wide bench. Keep their elbows out. What that does, look at this right here. It's exposed. So what you want to do, keep it in. That decreases the risk. There's always a risk with benching. So one thing you want to do is you want to try and bend the bar. We are actually pushing toward the pinky. So try and bend the bar like this. So you push up against that. That activates your lats and keeps your elbows in. Come down, come up. Come go. down, good form, and up. Coming down. He's pretty, he's pretty much pushing in a straight line, but sometimes as you fatigue, you might want to start to drift just towards your Is chin that slightly. J lift, I believe. Yeah, yeah, a little bit of a, Boom. a little bit of an angle. Yep. So by keeping your elbows in, it decreases the risk. You see a lot of people, and this is a new thing, is they only come to here takes the risk out of the movement. And that's also one of the reasons the slingshot is really cool. And I'm a huge fan of the slingshot. So your most susceptible place for injury in a bench press is the lower you are. This is opened up, it's exposed. What the slingshot does, it allows you to have more tension at the top, kind of like a reverse band squat. It's almost like a reverse band. But at the top, you're at full. At the bottom, it takes a little bit off, decreasing the chance of injury. So as you go heavier in bench press, the slingshot, I believe, helps to decrease your injury risk while also maximizing your muscular tension, overload, and recruitment at the top. 100%, and we'll go over the slingshot a little bit more uh, as, as we tend to add more weight. Uh, but he's absolutely right. Uh, as you come down in the bench press, as you bring the weight down, I've always said the slingshot acts as double muscle. Uh, the slingshot is going to expand and stretch. And guess what your muscles are doing as you're going through the eccentric portion of the bench press? They're expanding and they're stretching as well. And then they're going to contract and shorten. And so the slingshot is going to do it with you. And it's a nice passive way to get some tension off the elbows, get some tension off the shoulders. But I want to show you, you know, there's, there's some different styles that people will utilize. Sometimes uh, we have people that have hurt backs. We have people that want to bodybuild. They maybe want to build up their chest. And maybe they're not as interested as ha in handling the most amount of weight the safest way. But I will always stand on the fact that you should be bench pressing probably like a power lifter if you want to have longevity in this game and it's a great thing to learn and then you could always learn other applications and other ways of lifting afterwards because once you got the fundamentals down and understand why you lift that way then you can reduce the weight and you can do like kind of bodybuilder reps so i'm just going to show you if i was to do some kind of bodybuilding bench pressing if i was to do sets of 12 or something like that here's how i would do it but notice his setup is the exact same as he just showed you. So bench press, you want to get into a groove, a routine, like anything in life. The only difference is just going to be, I'm just going to keep constant tension on the muscle here. Yep. So it's a touch and go. Sometimes I will do rest at the bottom just to get the maximal recruitment. But you look at that, and he's not locking out at the top. Powerlifting, you lock out. That's how you get that green light, right? Now, in bodybuilding, when you lock out your elbows, well, I like elbows. I personally really like my elbows. You also get to rest a little bit. Yep. So when you're not locking out your elbows, again, are you stimulating your tri triceps as much? Probably not. But are you stimulating your chest? Absolutely. And we're training bench press for bodybuilding. We're obviously wanting to keep the maximum amount of tension on our pectorals. And if you can kind of bring the camera over to the side here or this side, whichever side, um, as you'll notice, when I go to lay back, I can get my back nice and flat on the bench if I just simply keep my feet up. So for people that have injured backs, I would suggest that you very rarely even bother trying to bench this way. I would bench either feet like this here. Now you can see my back is flat or I'd even have my feet up like this. Now, one of the things with having your feet up is we now have to pay a lot of attention to the shoulders and the integrity of the shoulder because because you took the, your legs out of the lift, now we got more stress and more strain up top. So you just have to be careful and probably be 
even more diligent with your form and technique. Now, one thing I want to show you is neutral spine is very important. Neutral spine would be when you're squatting. When you do this, think about where your spine is, compressed, right? Do this extended. Whereas if you're staring straight ahead, your chin's right about in this line, so you want to have an imaginary object 10 feet in front of you on the floor. That's your neutral spine. Now, for those of us with thicker backs, as we lay down, to put our head on the bench, like I have a very thick back. This won't apply to a lot of people, but as, even if I'm setting up just to screw around a little bit. So as I come in, I'm tucking. As I come down to keep neutral spine, I almost have to have my head off the bench. For a lot of people, that doesn't apply. For those thicker people, for those with the double C's after thick, mm -hmm. that's where it's going to be. So I'm going to come up, come down. So I'm tucking my chin but my spine is neutral. If I'm like this, there's no stability. So do you tuck your chin? I do the same thing. Okay. Yeah. So people see me dumbbell bench press and they're looking and they're like, whoa, why is your head up? Well, for most people that might not apply for smaller dudes, but for big strapping old men like us. <laughs> so just like Mark does, boom. So I do a little touch and go. Again, I'm not coming every time, one. I'm not doing that. For bodybuilding, it's nice, controlled, concise. And again, we're not going for 405. We're not going for 515. We're, we're simply going to, you know, do the higher rep sets. Now you get some freaks. You can do 405 for 12. I'm not doing that today. <laughs> you know, and another thing to keep in mind here is, uh, there's, there's going to be different grips. You know, you, you guys can go with, uh, whatever grip feels comfortable. What I would recommend and suggest if you're trying to get really, really strong is to break records with different grips. This is something that was brought up a lot by Louis Simmons of Westside Barbell was he said he would say, I have a record with my pinky on the smooth part of the bar. I have a record, uh, you know, thumb away from the power rings or, or thumb away from the smooth part. Uh, I got a record this way. I got a record with my ring finger on there because you want to be strong in a bunch of different positions and you want to actually explore uh, and exploit rather where you're weak. Because once you do that, then you're going to make yourself very, very strong because you'll be strong in many, many different positions and it won't matter where you're pressing from. You'll be able to hammer through all those kind of tough angles. We're going to throw on another plate. All right, so this is 225. Let me, uh, let me actually just show you these guys real quick on how to wrap the wrist. Yeah. So this is really important, is how you wrap your wrist. Because I see a lot of people, they a lot of times will just have the wrist wrap down here, where it's only on their wrist. But you do some boxing, right? Yeah. And where do you wrap when you box? You wrap your hands, you wrap yeah. your wrist. Right, yeah, you wrap your hands and your wrist. So in this case, we're not going to really necessarily wrap our hand too much, but we're going to wrap the bottom portion of our fist, okay? We're going to wrap across down here, and now we're going to get some tension there. And this isn't big weight. This isn't crazy weight or anything like that, but we want to try to create some stability to the wrist. And in some cases, when you do start to bench really big weights, 300 pounds, 400 pounds, and things of that nature, you got to think the weakest link in this whole bunch is going to be the wrist joint. It's going to be kind of the smallest joint involved, right? And so we might need to clamp that thing down so hard that we need almost like a cast, right? So here we go, set of six. Today, Mark and I will go back and forth with just a couple of sets of six, just trying to display some good uh, tempo, just a three, four seconds on the way down, just some control and just kind of normal uh, pressing of the weight. So shoulder blades are locked in. Now I'm going to flex my legs and I'm going to push myself that way very hard throughout the whole range of motion. I'm not sure how many reps that is. I lost count. Six. There we go. Oh, I made it. I knew you count that high, I really did. All right, here we go. Here goes Mr. Lobeliner. So 
So you want to have some a similar demonstration of how he was lifting when we only had one plate on there. Nice and smooth. Yes, sir. Looking good. If I was working with Mark and I was trying to get his bench press to increase more, um, I would be trying to figure out ways of having him to be able to even pull his elbows in more. But what you guys may not be able to see on camera, if you can turn around and spread these lats a little bit for us, how difficult is it when you're, <laughs> when you're, yeah, when your lats go out this wide, when you develop the back of a professional bodybuilder, trying to bring your elbow in, it's like it won't go in because it's like resting on muscle. But for those of you that haven't got this jacked yet, that's kind of the goal. You want to build up muscles that are so swole that you end up with really good leverages. That's how a lot of big fat power lifters end up with really good leverage. You just make yourself as big as you can and you don't have to necessarily be fat. You might want to try to go a slightly different route and be big and fat rather than just being fat, but it can help create some great leverages. You know, in my powerlifting day, uh, I was able to build up some really big arms, big triceps and having some decent lats, you are trying to literally rest your tricep on your lat. You're trying to have your bicep make contact with your forearm as you're coming down because that creates a lot of great leverages. So we're going to do a couple sets uh, now with the, uh, with the slingshot on as well and show you how that works. slingshot these are made out of the same material uh, the only difference is this one uh, has an angled sleeve to it so the sleeve comes out a little wider at the top it's very easy to get on I mean you can use some assistance from a from a lifting partner who can just give me like a little nudge into there but it doesn't have to be a like, super tight or anything I've always liked to wear them Microphone. microphone sorry about that uh so i'm wearing the uh full bore slingshot he was holding on to the original slingshot i just had him assist me into this just a little bit um so basically this has an angled sleeve and this is going to give me just a little bit more tension than the red slingshot people ask so many questions about this all the time like, isn't that cheating isn't that this or that you use the slingshot what are some of your opinions on it i i said it before man slingshot is for someone who doesn't Admittedly, I'm only up to 225, and my goal is usually get 30 plus reps. I combine style it because I'm getting older, and as you, my lats are a problem. I've actually gone to people, bench press pros. I can't bring my elbows in enough, puts my shoulder in a very precarious position. I, I've never, t knock on wood, never fully torn, but I've strained my pec multiple times. For me, I use 225 as a repetition challenge. Now, the slingshot is the only way I will ever go over 225 because it brings me at the most susceptible, most injury prone part of the movement and takes the risk, lowers the risk dramatically. And at the end of the day, what are we looking to do? At, when you're coming down here, you're working a lot of things, a lot of lat and front delt. Your pec really gets right about here. It's like try flexing your pec when you're down here. Yeah, right, right. No, nothing, like it's hard, right? Yeah. You're up here, boom. Boom, boom, boom. So just simple, just look equation. Like this is where, right here. Oh yeah, oh yeah, look at that. Like simple, wow. if you come is up just here, me? Just me? <laughs> if, you, if you come up, like this is the area you want. Right. So what the slingshot allows you to get that full range of motion, work through the entire range of the muscle's ability, but take the risk out of the more um, prone range, where you're more prone to injury. And that's what's, that's what's beautiful about it. All right, here we go. Setup is all the same. Really no different. Setup is the same. The only thing is, is with a slingshot on, if you know if you're normally comfortable with your hands here, you might be a little more comfortable with your hands out a little bit wider. It might present an opportunity for you that maybe otherwise wouldn't have. Now right through here is where the, you start to really feel the slingshot help and kick in. 
and give support. So about the cheating thing, I mean, this isn't a sanctioned lift. My goal is to overload the muscle and get as jacked and tan as possible. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, what, right. what the hell? Yeah. Um, so it's this way? It does, yep. It does assist with the lift. It does help. Um, and I think in fitness, I think there's this idea of we're always trying to make everything harder all the time. That's not a bad way to look at things. I mean, it's, it's good to make things more difficult here and there. But what I'm obsessed with, what I'm trying to help people with, I'm trying to make the world a better place to lift. And if I can help you feel better in your workouts, my theory, and this is my um, kind of mission, is to help people just be in a good mood while they're training. Like, have fun with it. And I know from personal experience, it's really hard to have fun in the gym when something hurts. You ever have your elbow flare up when you're training? Your shoulder? You ever run into injuries like that? Have you ever not? I mean, <laughs> right. I mean, that's, bro, I'm 40. <laughs> so I'm a man. I'm a man. <laughs> but no, I mean, yes, you, you want to mitigate injuries. So the goal is to be able to perform as long as possible, as hard as possible, with as little bit of pain as possible. And any tool that helps you do that is welcome, should be used. Again, are you at the gym to look cool, to bench raw, or are you at the gym to get results, to make gains and be pain free and live an awesome life? I, I'm in for the latter. I don't give a shit about looking cool in the gym. It, it is what it is, although I do look cool. In terms of uh, bodybuilding, how important has it been to you to utilize some of the powerlifting movements? That is my, that's what I do. I'm a bench, I squat multiple times a week. Squatting is a powerlifting movement. Deadlifts, not only, I mean, it's, it's my main movement for athletes. It's my main movement for myself, whether it's a Romanian deadlift or a deadlift. And then pressing, uh, you know, dumbbell press, bench press. Dude, powerlifting is the basis. Look at the best bodies in the world. Ronnie Coleman, you know, those guys, they, they were built on Mark powerlifting. Bell. Yeah, they were, they were built on powerlifting. Here. I love it. Let's go. Let's yeah. see it. I've never used this angle before. All right. A little different. rest pause you know do the little like at the at the bottom you know do a pause rep come down and when you do a pause rep you're to get that weight going there's no momentum I believe it's called the rubber band effect and we're completely mitigating that here I got the you can keep oh, you do? and you completely mitigate the rubber band effect rubber band effect is essentially on a deadlift when you bounce it off the floor okay it's on the squat when you go down and come right up so on the bench press, when you come down and come right up. Whereas when you do a pause rep, you're generally going to do less weight, which is why in powerlifting, they don't allow you to bounce it off your chest. You come down and you come up. You have to hit it. You have to set it on your chest. Get the green light. 100%. Uh, yeah, what Mark is referring to, absolutely. It's a, it's a plyometric effect. You know, when you, when you go to come down with a weight, uh, you're able to explosively move the weight back in the other direction because there's stored energy in your body. This would explain why if you were to try to jump onto this, why you would want to go downward quickly to be able to explode back up and jump onto this. If you didn't do that pr uh, beforehand, it'd be kind of hard, even though that's not very high. Yeah. It'd be kind of tough just to kind of lift off from right here and jump on that. I actually think I would pretty sure I'd eat shit. Yeah. So I'm going to give uh, 315 a go and get some reps in there. You can have that 315. <laughs> this is the steroid weight. Yeah, that's the steroid that's weight. Cool. Um, hopefully you don't hit your wife. Because <laughs> yeah. as we found, all steroid users beat their wives in earlier filmings today. Um, we learned a lot. I, 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 I've literally been behind. If I'm really going to be a steroid user, I need, to, I need to start being more violent. I thought that's the reason why you started boxing. <laughs> oh, man.
All right, so you look at his setup. Again, the setup, whether it was 135 or 315, exactly the same. Same routine, gets in the groove, retracted scapula, butt on the bench, arch in the lower back, shoulder blades, elbows in. That's how you do it. Looking good, man, I must say. I'm gonna let you have the heavyweight today. Last time, last time I came here, I was given that 405 ride, but I ain't gonna lie. Haven't done the flat bench in a while. This is another lesson, not making excuses, but when you haven't, don't let ego get in the way. If you haven't done something in a while, ease back in. Don't let the ego get the best of you. Can I, can I ego you until 25? I'd rather not. Right. I'd rather not. I'm smart. My wife will get mad at me. Because I'm going to hurt some, I'm going to come back. Like, ah, oh, here you go. I'm just going to be completely smart today, which is a first. Showing a lot of restraint. I don't know if you can do it. <laughs> we'll see. Well, I only warmed up once with this. Let's see how it goes. There's many, many different ways to use a slingshot. In a lot of the training that we do here at Super Training Gym, we oftentimes will use it for the last three sets or so. Here goes Mark. He's got the full bore slingshot on. He's wearing a 2X. He weighs about 220 pounds or so. Moving around 225. There you go, clean. I also personally like the way that you can stay connected to that weight when you're utilizing a slingshot. You know what I'll do? If we want to show another way to do this for reps, why don't we go for an AMRAP? with 225 next set with the slingshot. Yeah. I think that'd be fun. That'd be so great. So a lot of people look at these as powerlifting. What if we were to use this for a higher rep challenge set? What do we get? I mean, why not? Yeah. That way I don't look like such a pussy. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me get four plates on here. Oh, uh, this, this bitch right here. <laughs> let me move that around for a minute. I'll put this down. One of the things here, and, and one of the reasons why it's so great to have Mark uh, in town today is he's somebody that lives it, you know? He owns Tiger Fitness, the shirt that he's wearing, tigerfitness.com, owned it for many years. Um, but he doesn't just own his own supplement company. He doesn't just own a company that ships out supplements. He knows a lot about them. He utilizes them. And for me, you know, I've been benching over 405 since I was 18 years old. I'm 43, and so part of this sometimes is just to say, hey, look, you know, I can still do this stuff. I can still get underneath these weights. These aren't the weights that I lifted uh, a few, few years back when I was full blast power lifting, but um, still, not, still not bad, still not shabby. And it, the main thing here, though, is that I get to do things that are really fun. Like, this is, this is my idea of fun. This is my version of fun. Some people might like to get a motorcycle and... Uh, you know, go flying off of jumps and different things, or they might love to go skiing or whatever. This is uh, the best thing that I came up with for my version of fun, and this is the way I love to do things. And so this allows me to do stuff uh, that I've been doing since I was a teenager. It makes me feel great. You know, that's the thing. Um, you know, we, we're in the social media jungle. We're on YouTube. Like, we're, 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 not, we're not exactly those 25-year-olds in the cool shorts and the shit, the pretty boys. Like we've been in the trenches for a long, long time. And we're still in it because we're so good looking. <laughs> like that's what puts us here. But, you know, one thing is we've, we've had our injuries, but as we've gotten that, we're trying to give you the tools to not go through what we went through. We've made the mistakes. We've made the diet mistakes. We've made the training mistakes. We've made the lifestyle mistakes. We've made a lot of mistakes. At least I have. Um, but through all that, as we, you know, as we get better, we're still able to do stuff we did in our 20s, in our 30s, you know, and that's what's beautiful about it. Again, set up exactly the same. Tireless. Quad tension. See, everything's tight. Feet on the floor, 
Beautiful. And that's the set. Probably get five, but... That was a good four. <laughs> that was a good four. So what I'm going to do now, we've seen this, this heavy. So my goal now, for you CrossFitters out there, <laughs> is AMRAP. Now, Perfect. if I would have known I was doing here, as many reps as possible. So we're going to put on 225. And towards the end, my reps are going to get, my reps are going to get shorter. Are you sure? I got, I, I'm multi-talented, I'll at least get one. So, as it goes, I don't really give a shit about doing the full everything range and locking out each set and pausing. You're gonna see me get into a zone. I'm gonna get my mind right. I'm gonna get on the bench and I'm gonna just go. And what I do, if I'm doing an AMRAP, is I usually go, I count by either fives or tens. So one thing I learned from a magician um, was at Copperfield, I believe. When he was in, was it him? He was in the shark tank or whatever. He was in a water tank and he sat in there for like two weeks. How'd you do it? Well, I did it one minute at a time. Counted to 60, counted to 60. And he marked down every time he counted to 60 and it went by like that. So by micro counting, you're basically doing three sets of 10 rather than one set of 30. So it makes it different mentally. So things like that. But the thing about the slingshot, is you're gonna get a little bit of rubber band effect, but you're putting maximum overload and force on your muscles. So if you're one of those guys who doesn't wanna, you're afraid, like me, I'm afraid to go heavy on bench because I've had some issues, right? Doesn't mean you, don't, you can't do barbell bench. Just take a weight. 225 for me is someone who, if I really got into it, could probably, probably hit 450 in a couple weeks. 225, maybe you do 135, maybe you do 95. But I think there's always a place for barbell bench. I get the best pump from barbell bench of any exercise, believe it or not. And I wish I didn't have issues snapping shit up. But let's get into it. It's a great exercise. You know, it's an, it's an all over exercise. You know, I think it's one of the best upper body exercises you can do. If for whatever reason uh, you have a hard time bench pressing, you might want to get yourself a slingshot. You can go over to markbellslingshot.com and check out everything we have. We also sell the products on Amazon, and we've been doing so for many, many years. You can look at the reviews. You can look at how many stars it has, and you can look at uh, all the different people that have used it for rotator cuff injuries, pec injuries. It's used by the NFL, the NBA, the MLB, um, every major sport that you can possibly think of, and it's helped a lot of people, so maybe it would help you. In addition to that, if you really struggle with bench, you can also do dumbbell bench. Yes. You know, there's no reason why you can't figure out some sort of pressing that's going to really benefit you a lot. And uh, dumbbell bench press is amazing. Um, dumbbell bench press can help build up your chest a lot. It's a little easier to do. Uh, it's a little easier in terms of doing like a flat bench. Um, I'm sorry, incline bench. You know, the lift off on an incline bench, you always need a spotter and stuff like that. But when you do dumbbells, uh, it might, you might find it a little easier to do the exercises there. You're going to be able to build up a great chest, and you'll probably never hurt your shoulders doing some uh, dumbbell bench pressing. So here we go. All right. He's going to get after it with some repetitions. You want a little lift, or you can... No, I'll get it off. A spot? You I get, get spot. off on my own. Yep, you get a spot. I got it, I got it, I got it. Great dad joke. <clears throat> All right, Cross, just in case I break a PR, you got to get your camera going, too. Just in case, or in case I make an ass of myself, it'll be a good blooper. So I'm gonna go beyond failure. So um, the last one, just help me pick it Mark, up. seriously, haven't you failed enough here today? <laughs> I fail every day in life. Can we please just, you know, the not. The difference is my wife's not here to tell me I failed, but she is. She gives me the look, man. She's like, the TF stands for total failure. Here we go. Oh no, <laughs> he did it. He did it. Uh, I of that. All right. I'm just trying to give you motivation. Sully, where are you at? Let's get a spot here. So you get, how much does that man weigh? He weighs uh, 462 pounds. Oh, yeah, 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 462. Here we go. There we go, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 
27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, yeah. Woo, 40, 41, 42, yeah. Yep, 43, 44. Hell yeah. Woo. That's a pump. That's, that's <laughs> one. You're taking a nude photo. Put on a female watch and then take it after doing that set. You know the female watch, right? It's smaller. So oh, oh, I got you. Year, it looks bigger. Mm. I'm just saying. Not that I've ever done it. Look at those boobs. It's, I wow. Can't even, I can't even move them. See, I'm, I you were like an A, B. Now you're clearly a C. <laughs> Damn, dude, that's I impressive. I can't move them right now. That's all I got. Damn, they're popping. So if you want a quick workout, say you got 15 minutes in the gym, a couple warm-up sets, AMRAP, your chest is done. Look at the veins in his arms are going bonkers. I can't, well, I can't move my chest. Like, that is awesome. Woo, that was crazy. So... What I'll, do, what I'll do right here is uh, I'm going to do some reps too, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it uh, with the slingshot just on one arm, so I'll have it off. Then I'm going to sit at the end of the bench. I'll put the slingshot shot all the way on, and then I'll see proceed and do some reps and just kind of do like almost like a rest pause type of move. Let's see how it goes. I need to start incorporating that like weekly. Like that is ridiculous. That was nice. That felt great. <laughs> That felt great. I, I am unfair advantage. I took that brain shot, man. Oh yeah, mind bullet. Yeah. Yeah, I'm smart. I've never felt this smart in my life. In the wrist. Again, I'm just keeping this on just so it's uh, just so it'll be it'll be easy to get it on after the set. So this is an intensity technique right here. Now, intensity techniques would be something like four reps, drop sets. Here's another way of doing it. There you go. Come on. 12, 13, 14, 17, 18, 7, 28, 30, 31, 33, 34, 5, 6, 37, 40. I think it's time for that NFL combine, man. So this is an intensity technique. Go beyond failure or right up to failure. And then a little bit of assistance here. Complete intensity technique right here. Comes down. And remember, you just went to failure. Up. Wow. I feel like it's going to blow my chest right off. Yeah, the pump is ridiculous. Wow. The pump is real. I still, I'm just now starting to gain where I can flex them again. <laughs> like the blood flow is ridiculous. If, uh, if we got some questions, uh, please start asking some of them now. Um, <clears throat> a couple other ways I've used a slingshot in training <clears throat> was to incorporate it for the last couple of sets of a workout. So whatever workout system you do currently, I don't need to impede upon that. I don't need to have you fire your coach. Do your three sets of three, your six sets of two, your six sets of four, whatever the heck it is programmed for you. But throw the slingshot on at the end, once you're done with that. So you're going from doing your raw work to putting on your slingshot and do three extra sets. Let's say your working weight was right here, 225. Well, when you're done with the 225 for however many sets you were supposed to do it, you're gonna throw a 10 on. 
Throw 10 on each side of the bar, additional 20 pounds. See how that goes. It goes well. Go ahead and throw another 10 on there and see how that goes. Maybe do a third set, maybe even do a fourth set. These are all ways that we used it here at Super Training Gym. We had great success with it. Mark brought up an excellent point. It's always interesting to get around bodybuilders because they just have, they just, they end up realizing stuff without ever telling him. Like I don't remember ever telling Mark to pause on the bench press when he's using a slingshot, but intuitively that's what he mentioned. Mm -hmm. And you should be because you don't want to be taken advantage of. Yes, it can be fun for the first time ever to bench three plates that way and springboard it off your chest, but that's not a really legitimate bench press. That's not what the slingshot was created for. The slingshot is created for you to wrap your mind around what your body is actually capable of. And it's kind of re refers to something called the future method. You're in recognition of, I can actually do three plates. I did it. I had the assistance of that slingshot, but I know that my body is going to be capable of, capable of that in the future. And so I think whenever you're utilizing a slingshot, try to use a little bit of a pause uh, at the bottom of the bench press. Last thing I just want to touch upon is that most of the time what I see, and you can share your experience as well, most of the time what I see just in fitness in general, whether it be strength training, bodybuilding, whatever it is, bodybuilders, they want to know, hey man, how do you tighten up at the end of the, you know, how do you, how do you get that last little bit to get so shredded on stage? Powerlifters want to know, hey man, how can I become more explosive off the floor in a deadlift? Or how can I uh, do a better job of locking out uh, my, my bench press? The answer is always the same. It doesn't matter what we're talking about. Everything matters, but the most important thing oftentimes is how you start. How you start is probably going to be indicative of how you're going to be able to finish. And you don't get shredded for a bodybuilding show in the last couple weeks. That's a complete myth. <laughs> That's not really actually true. Maybe the last little bit starts to fall off. Maybe the last three pounds, maybe the last four pounds, five pounds maybe even, depending. But you're going to be shredded many weeks out if you're going to be really prepped. And how you start your diet and how you prep throughout the whole thing is going to be really, really important. So it doesn't matter what lift we're talking about. People ask questions all the time. How do I get a big bench press? You got to work on your form and technique over and over and over again. Because where you start, a lot of times, is going to be where you finish. The way that you unrack the weight isn't just a little thing in the equation. It's everything. How you unrack a squat is everything. You mess up how you unrack it, you're done. You're not going to make the lift. No, I mean, he's absolutely correct. I mean, a lot of people look at these last-minute things like, oh, I got to you're either ready or you're not. You know what, you either start it right or you don't. And a lot of people think there's a magic touch to getting bodybuilders ready. Like, look at these guys now, it's like six, eight weeks out. Like, back in the day, they didn't get as lean. Like, back in the day, these guys would literally start like eight weeks out and somehow get in shape. But it's gotten harder. And if you want to be good at anything, again, your start needs to be as good as the finish. It's a process. Nothing just happens overnight. Like, this whole, like, oh, 12 weeks to the new you, it depends. Where'd you start? Like if you started at 300 pounds, you're not going to be 170 pounds and shredded in 12 weeks. If you started within strikeable distance, yeah, that might happen. So, you know, you really have to hone in on the fact that there's no magic bullet. Like we've been doing this, I've been doing this for 27 years, lifting, being a part in athletics and all that. And um, man, none of it just happened. I didn't have one thing like, yeah, man, that was the best six weeks of my life. Man, if it wasn't for that, no, no, it's been a grind. A grind, a grind every year, training, 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 you know, every year gaining a pound of lean muscle, you know, maybe getting a little bit leaner when I shred down, maybe getting a little, a couple more reps on my bench press. Like when I started, I didn't like oh, 225, I'm gonna do that 45 reps. It doesn't happen. Like that's years and years and years of preparation, of training, every meal, every rep, every, everything you do leads to where you're at today. What do we got questions wise? Um, Ambrose asks, Max Bench has been stuck at 260 for months. What kind of accessories or rep ranges would you recommend for increasing numbers? Uh, it's, you know, it's very difficult sometimes to evaluate someone's bench press without seeing it. But again, I have to refer back to what I just said is a lot of times I see people are overreaching 
and they're kind of thinking about what they're going to be able to do kind of towards the end of something or to be able to get to a certain destination. And I would like you to think about what you currently do because what you currently do isn't really working out the way that you would like it. Otherwise, you wouldn't ask the question in the first place. So the most logical thing that I can tell you is the assistance exercises are important, but please just reduce the weights that you're using in training. Whatever it is that you're currently doing with your training, back everything up about 10%. Are you doing every rep perfect? You know, if you have a lifting partner, if you have somebody with you, I mean, Mark uh, lifts with Brandon Curry here and there, and he's lifted with some of the best bodybuilders. And when you lift with the best bodybuilders and some of the best coaches around and some of the best power lifters, how often do you get to be able to just do a rep without anybody saying anything? Yeah, I, and uh, aside from looking at form, maybe you're not plateaued. Maybe that's just where, maybe you just need to be more patient. Did he give a specific time frame? He could mean two weeks. Um, if we were going up incrementally every workout, you and I would be benching 8,000 pounds right now. But unfortunately, we're not. Like, so every, when you get to a certain level, every pound is a chore. Every pound should be celebrated. So the goal is, again, back it down, but how are you, have you tried 270? Like he said 265, like is he putting a two and a half on each side or is he going straight up to 285? Like I want to know how he's stuck. Has he tried 270 or is he trying to go up by five pounds each side? Maybe smaller increments. <laughs> so that's the question. One is maybe you need to be more patient with your program. Two is the form. Obviously look at it, microanalyze, back it down a little bit. Three is maybe it's not. Maybe it's not a plateau. Maybe it's just life. Sometimes uh, in seminars, it's amazing because somebody's like, yeah, man, I'm really stuck at 265. And I'll say, oh, well, how, you know, how long have you been stuck there? Like, man, it's been like three weeks. <laughs> and we're just like, yeah, that's going to happen. And, and then also, you know, the guy forgets to tell you that he recently just lost 100 pounds and that his best bench press previously was 95 pounds. And somewhere along the line, he tore his rotator cuff or something. It's like a lot of information sometimes, sometimes is missing. But again, what I would suggest is what I've seen from most people is they're just sometimes are lifting too heavy and doing it too often. And what Mark said is dead on. You might need to be a little bit more patient. Next question. How do you identify weakness? Triceps versus chest versus shoulders. You constantly talk about working on your weakness, but how do you figure it out? Well, I mean, if we're talking about strength, um, you look at what part of the bench press you're getting stuck in. Like, if you're getting stuck at the bottom, that's generally going to be a chest issue. If you're getting stuck from here on out, that's a lockout issue, where I'd work on floor press and other accessories. From a muscle standpoint, you know, and I'm going to go on this because there's probably a lot of bodybuilders or even power lifters who want to be sexy, right? Um, you know, if you're looking at a muscular standpoint, generally speaking, my arms are too small for my torso. Sometimes God did it. You know, your genetic insertions are your genetic insertions. Your genetic, your genetic predispositions are your genetic predispositions. So obviously, if your triceps are, are weak, you're going to know, right? But if it's as far as a strength or a lift... Yeah, I mean, you'll know what's weak, and that's where I always loved rack lockouts. I always loved setting the pin at your weakest point. What you do, and when I used to train powerlifters, way, this way back, like when I was like 20, right? Like, okay, where are you getting stuck? Well, I can't, if, a lot of times people get it off the chest, they get stuck here. Sometimes they bring it out, nope, 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 that's your chest. So what you do is you set the rack at your weakness. And, you know, if it's your tricep, yeah, you're, you're going to get it, and you're stuck right here. That's when I think a rack or a floor press would come in handy. I mean, what's your... Uh... Yeah, you know, I, I would agree with some of what he said right there. You know, um, trying to assess where the weakness is coming from. I don't know if anybody would ever really be able to truly tell you. But the way that Mark is going about it, I think, makes a lot of sense. Even just looking in the mirror, you know, just look like that's what bodybuilders do a lot of times. And I, I think... A lot of bodybuilders end up being really, really strong. A lot of times they just don't practice doing one rep maxes. A lot of times they don't tap into the central nervous system that much. And so it's just they have a different way of training. But that's what I would really look at is, you know, why not look in the mirror? I heard that uh, Phil Heath uh, used to uh, take photos of himself every couple of weeks, and he would circle, you know, whatever the weak points were. And he's like, this needs to be brought up, that needs to be brought up. Um, you know, maybe you're not as hypercritical of yourself as that, but I think a self-evaluation, like if you, if you have monstrous triceps, you probably don't have trouble locking out your benches. 
Um, if you have a monster chest, just bench press in general probably isn't that uh, difficult for you unless you have some sort of pre-existing injury. So yeah, trying to identify them is, is very tough, but I love the idea of doing rack uh, work, rack lockouts for deadlift. Um, in bench pressing, there's so many different exercises to choose from. You got things like a floor press. You can work on speed work. A lot of times people just run out of energy because they weren't able to do the lift fast enough. And then you just, you just start to kind of lose your explosiveness at that moment. And so that would be another thing to assess is maybe you need to do a little bit of that. The last thing is sometimes people just don't recover from their workouts and they're always kind of shot and they're always beating themselves down from the workout. So sometimes you might need to uh, kind of reload, you know, and, and almost start over and start a new foundation. James asks, how often do you recommend doing and going to failure? Thanks for the great info you guys put out. Love the content. For powerlifting, um, for powerlifting, it's important to really, you kind of almost want to avoid some failure. Uh, the failures are going to happen anyway, especially if you're a newer lifter. And anytime an exercise is new, there's always the possibility that you uh, overestimated, you know, uh, what, what you could actually lift. Um, but from a powerlifting perspective, the best powerlifters I've ever seen don't miss weights. Um, they might, however, every once in a while go to go for a triple and only get a single. I've seen that a little bit, but like when Stan Efferding was lifting with us, some of the other stronger lifters in my gym, and even for myself, when I was at my strongest, um, it would just be really, really rare. I, I would go a year or two without missing a lift. And if I was going to miss anything, it would probably be in a contest and it would probably be, uh, for a technical reason, but other people in the gym that were working on getting stronger, they'd miss lifts all the time and they'd stay plateaued. And it's, it can be way, way different when it comes to bodybuilding. Uh, bodybuilding is so individual and unique. Now you got to be careful how often you go to failure. We were at a, we were in a training zone. Like every, like do what we just did right here, that was every workout, like six days a week. And there were two weeks where we couldn't get out of bed. Like our nervous system was just like, at the same time, all three of us, our nervous system reached in its pocket. It's like no more. And that's what happens. So bodybuilding, I would be selective about it. Like I'm not going to do that every time, but you know, every, maybe maybe pick a body part a week and that depends on your overall training volume your you know but look at dorian dorian yates trained four days a week four days a week and only did one set of each exercise to failure but when he went beyond failure he did kind of what i did there but for every single working set which was four to five per workout and he can only train four days a week and that's all he did like that's another thing we have jobs families lack of sleep stress, stress. Yeah. Like these guys do it for a living. So my advice would be, be, be very cognizant and very aware of your body, how you're feeling. Are you sleeping? Are you too tired? Are you not able to sleep? Um, how's your appetite? Is it too high? Is it too low? Both can be signs of not overtraining, but overreaching or nervous system fatigue. Um, reaction time. If someone threw a tennis ball at you, could you catch it? Or would you be like, it would hit you in the face, then you'd move up. Those are all telltale signs that, hey, you need to back off, but look, your body's not going to grow accustomed to and adapt or to anything unless you push to that brink of like discomfort. And even Arnold said, you know, the first eight reps, whatever, it's the last three that you barely got. Those are what make the difference. While there has yet to be really science to back that up, it, it's kind of been proven in the trenches. So I'm going to say it depends on the person, but be cognizant and don't do it every workout. I would also just like to add there's different versions of failure too. So there's like going, you know, like we did right there on that last set. Uh, that was pretty much, you know, going all in. But there's other versions. If Mark and I went back and forth and did uh, sets of 15 or 20 reps of 225, by the third or fourth set, there would be some failure going on. That's a, that's a way different stressor rather than us just saying, hey, let's go. All right, Mark, we're going to start with 365, and we're going to do like a strip set. Like the brutality of that strip set is going to be uh, far outweigh uh, the, what we did with the lighter weight. So yeah. there's it, really some major differences. I, I'm not sh I don't want to speak for Mark's training, but I know for my own, with me doing some bodybuilding type stuff, I probably go to failure about twice a workout, but it's not the intensity level is not always completely through the roof. How about for yourself? 
I think this is a good addition that to failure and beyond failure, yeah, two separate right, things. Right. So beyond failure, I pushed mentally beyond failure and I couldn't, like I couldn't, you could have helped me, you would have curled it. <laughs> like there was nothing more. Um, that, I, that, that sort of failure, okay, you know what, that, that's maybe two to three times a week if, you, if, you're, if you're experienced. Whereas, you know, um, just going to failure where it's like, I can't get another rep, bro, but you didn't do any partials or anything different. Right. Nervous system, muscular system, different things, different things. How often would you recommend doing let offs and drop sets? Where would you implement that in your training? I mean, that kind of falls into what we just talked about. Drop sets and intensity technique. It's a way to get more reps, more load, more total tonnage. I like to call it to your muscle, um, more weight lifted. And it goes into the progressive overload. Progressive overload is the number one way to it's, it's the number one variable in stimulating hypertrophy, in my opinion. Um, so I would obviously there's other ways, but that that's a great variable it's a way to, it's a measurable variable so I would say that drop sets are, are just like this you know I wouldn't mind seeing you and you could do drop sets not to failure like you could do 10 8 6 and you're like one to two reps shy of failure but you can get three of 80 versus getting one of 100 you know what I mean so you do that drop set again more total weight lifted and drop sets if you're not going to failure I don't really see a reason why you can't just do those as you deem fit if you want. Drop sets are amazing, and I think that with a newer lifter, uh, sometimes it's almost completely necessary to do it because sometimes they just can't handle enough weight. Um, I've seen it happen many times where we're lifting in a group, and the, the group starts to kind of disappear <clears throat> because here at Super Training, uh, we'll do max effort work. We pick an exercise, we go as heavy as we can on it. And if we were doing something like a floor press back in the day, uh, you know, I would use a plate, two plates, three plates, so on, and get up to like six plates. Well, by the time I got to like four plates, the group is pretty narrow. There's not that many guys uh, lifting with me at that point. So my point here is that <clears throat> how much more work am I getting in by doing four plates? How much more volume am I getting in? So those, the newer guys, the younger guys, they got to figure out a way. They, they're not going to be able to handle that amount of volume, but they got to figure out a way to somehow close that gap a little bit. And I think a great way to do it is to start out with a little bit heavier weight, strip some weight off. So, for example, they might go with, we've done this many times here, we, we have a, a plate, then we'll have two 25s on there. So it would be, you know, 235 pounds. We'd pull a quarter off. They'd do another, you know, another couple reps, pull the other quarter off, and now they're mo moving around at 135. Just a way for them to bring their intensity up because they haven't really developed that strength quite yet. And there's a lot of great techniques that you can utilize in the gym for that. And I would say that every time you work out, you're trying to present yourself with some sort of challenge. You're trying to make something difficult. I think Mark is... Uh, is being pretty modest like he he trains pretty hard like what we did yesterday was was a, was a good workout i know it's not his most intense workout but it was tough and some of the weights that we used they were they were pretty hard like it was not like uh we didn't go into some sort of insane mental clarity mode or anything like that but we we brushed up against that you know and i think that that's what you always want to do probably almost in every single workout you you want it to be challenging you want to sometimes when someone says hey man let's go do uh you know this exercise you want to be like i'm not sure that's going to work out you want that kind of stuff yeah you got to push yourself man <laughs> you, you got to push yourself and it depends how great you want to be like again look at ronnie can't walk dorian tore just about every muscle on his body now he just rides bicycles and does yoga and looks phenomenal and is in you know great health but you know to be the best, to, to get to a level, you got to be uncomfortable, whatever sport you're doing. So, you know, my thing is, depending on how good you want to be, but honestly, from just a health and a mental health standpoint, pushing beyond your limits is helpful in so many areas of life that I recommend doing it. You know, not every workout, and, and honestly, you just won't have, I don't have it in me, to every workout, <laughs> go to that level. I couldn't do it. No one can. You know, but when you're in there and you feel it, it's that day. Maybe you have a training partner in town. Maybe there's a hot girl in the gym you're trying to impress. Get it on. You know what I'm saying? All right, last couple questions. How many times a week should I bench, and how do you find your grip? Uh, normally, most successful people I've seen bench usually about twice a week.
And that's going to probably, you know, be an individual preference. And maybe as you get stronger, you can make the argument that you might have to shift it to one time a week to actually do a straight bar regular bench press. Uh, but there's many different ways to bench press. You know, could you on one day do incline benches? Could you have a heavy and a light day? I mean, <clears throat> old school powerlifting, that's pretty much what it was. It was like you had a light day, you had a heavy day, and you kind of flip-flop back and forth between those two things. So two times a week uh, for bench pressing. And then what was the other part of that? Uh, how do you figure out your grip? Oh, your grip? Um, you just go with what's comfortable, you know? Go with what feels good. And, you know, if we're talking powerlifting, the answer to that ends up being really easy. Uh, what grip can you bench press the most weight with? But I would also uh, encourage you to explore, you know, if you're really weak, if you're oddly weak with a certain grip, you need to explore that. You probably need to work on it uh, maybe in your warm-ups with really, really light weights. But if you can bench 225 with a kind of modest or close-ish grip, and then when you go to put your index finger on the power ring, um, you know, you can only do a plate. Like, that doesn't really make a lot of sense, and it hurts your shoulder and stuff. You're, you're going to want to try to figure that out. What, what could you do? Could you do some cable crossovers or flies, or could you bench with just a quarter on the bar uh, just to explore that and make that strong? Yeah, I mean, I've heard so many things on. But you look at Anthony Clark, one of the best benches of all times, reverse grip. You know, for powerlifting, again, explore and see where you feel the strongest. Generally speaking, you know, I always say, like, you know, where do I, where do I grab the bar? I'm like, well, just bend down and where your hands lie. You know, that's generally where your arms are going to lie, you know, like on a, on a deadlift or on a reverse, you know. Obviously, sumo is a little bit different. Um, you know, that's one way. Anatomically, it would be hard for yeah, you to be inside. You exactly. Shoulders. Be I, can't, I can't sumo. I can't sumo. So my whole thing is I was taught to go out here, scooping bring your elbows in. I was taught to go in here. You have a little more trouble. Again, a lot of people are different. You got your width. So again, like, like what he said, it, it's a very simplistic, it doesn't give us that wow factor. We came up with a great answer. I agree with you. Where can you bench the most weight? And always incorporate, I encourage this for powerlifters, incorporate dumbbells, incorporate unilateral movements. There's a lot of really good ones, unbalanced single arm presses. I've done demonstrations on those. We could do that later. It's a great ancillary movement to get your core involved, teach you how to activate your quads. Um, I'd encourage you to throw in some single arm dumbbell movements to really engage your core. People don't understand how important your quads and your core are for the bench press. So again, focus on those things, but grip, Where's your best grip? All right, let's just finish it up with this one. For Mark and Mark, best advice to give to new business owners? I'll let you oh, that. wow. Okay. Um, new business owners. Um, you know, I'm going to go back to a story that my father-in-law, he owned a business, um, a security business in Culver City, California. And I was doing a term paper for college. And the question was simple. And you're supposed to interview an entrepreneur, and he was easy. You know, he's my father-in-law. And it was, what is your definition of an entrepreneur? And I remember he looked over and he just said two words, an asshole. 94% of businesses fail. And you got to understand that for you to think that you're one of the 6% that are going to make it, you got to be an arrogant, cocky asshole to think that that's going to be you. So what I would recommend is, number one, be an expert at whatever you're doing. I'm an expert at what I do. Every business I own, I'm expert level at. I suck at every other area of life, but I'm really good at what I do. I'm really good, I learn, and I continue to learn. Number two is make sure you have a plan and make sure you have adequate money or you have a way to get that money, whether it's organically growing. Have a plan and know what it takes. So be an expert, have a plan with adequate financing. And of course, number three, it's not nine to five. You will never work for yourself. You will never truly be independent because if you're a successful business owner, you always work for your customers. Customers are number one. Say always pay again. attention. Repeat that again. It's important. Always focus on your customers. You never, ever, ever only work for yourself. You always work for someone else. You always have to pay taxes. There's no such thing as freedom. So to think that you're liberated, to think that I'm going to own my own business and just make my own hours. Your own hours are 24 hours a day. So unless you're willing to not sleep, unless you're willing to potentially, like I almost did destroy your marriage, we're reaping the benefits right now. We're living a great life. I wake up every morning living my dream, but it was 
fucking nightmare for 12 to 13 years of my life. So just know that success is not free. Know that you will never truly be independent because you will always answer to your customers. Should I drop the mic? Or, no, I'm just kidding. I think so. I think you got it. You're going to drop it. No, that was fantastic. That was, that was amazing. And the reason why I had you repeat that was, uh, you know, I don't know if, if some of you have ever been hanging out with somebody that has a job where they're, like, on call, and you kind of, like, you, you get, like, um, you get kind of nervous for that person because their, their, their phone goes off, and they, they have to immediately respond to it. Well, uh, that's the kind of job that we have. Yeah. Uh, it's different for us now because we've been able to hire people. But if you think back to those beginning stages, uh, just trying to get something off the ground, uh, that's where you start. And it can be very difficult, can be really stressful. Uh, it sounds like Mark was in a similar position to myself. Like, I was raising my kids at the same time and in the middle of my powerlifting career. So I got like, you know, six or seven selfish things kind of going on at one time and I have kids, and I have a wife, and you know, having children and having a wife and having a business, each thing needs its own separate time. You know, you don't just get to only hang out with the family, you have to hang out with the wife one-on-one. -on -one. Then you have to hang out with your child one-on-one. -on -one. Then you have to hang out with the other child one-on-one. -on -one. Then you have to hang out with people in your business one-on-one. -on -one. And it can be very time consuming. So the main thing I think is you just need to make sure that you are very, very, very interested in whatever it is that you're about to do. If you're interested enough in it, if you nodded your head, yes, fuck yes, I'm into it, I, I'm going to do it, then the second thing I would say is don't allow your dreams to die no matter what. And I think a key ingredient to this is to have good team members. You need to have good people around you. You need to find people in probably unconventional ways. Uh, they won't they're not going to probably come to you through like an ad that you put up on IG or something, although, you know, it's possible. Anything's possible, but you're probably going to run into these people at something where there's like-minded, interested people at, such as an expo, you know, for us in fitness, such as at a bodybuilding show, such as, I mean, imagine Mark start starting a supplement company. He goes to a bodybuilding show. There's going to be people that love supplements. There's going to be people that are passionate about supplements. He might run into someone there, and he's like, that guy knows what it's like to wake up at 4 a.m. and start his meals for the day. That guy knows what it's like to start, you know, start his day off with cardio and egg whites and oatmeal. Like, that guy knows what it's like to kind of live through the bullshit that you have to do uh, to be a bodybuilder. And you can start to see. You can, you can extrapolate this out into any other, anything else. Um, if, you meet, if you're an entrepreneur and you're just starting out and you have the ability to start hiring people, keep your eyes peeled and really pay attention to the way people talk. Are they talking like-minded? Do they not use some of the words that you don't use? Uh, is there something that you're like, oh, there's something special about that person. When you find these special people, it's now your job to bring them in, bring them in house and allow them to be entrepreneurs within your own business. I know that this is like looking way into the future because you're asking about getting started. But one of the things about getting started is you're only getting started. I remember having a conversation with Bradley Martin years ago about him opening up Zoo Culture, and he was asking, asking me some questions about super training and stuff. And he was so excited. He was so pumped. And I said, dude, I'm, I'm pumped for you. Like, that is so cool. But just know that tomorrow is just the start of everything. So get ready. You know, hunker down. Be ready because it's going to take a lot of energy. It's not about just liking it. You have to be thoroughly interested in it. You have to be really passionate about it. You have to be really excited about it. So that's my main thing is always I just want to make sure that people are really, can you see yourself doing it 20 years from now, 10 years from now? Those are the questions that I would kind of uh, run through your brain. And then the second thing is that you can be a material expert at a bunch of different things, and you can take things on, and Mark's well-read, and he's really smart. I never read a book in my life. I haven't really taken on trying to become an expert in some of these verticals that are business, but I've surrounded myself with other people that can handle that. My wife handles a lot of that stuff, and so I just end up deferring stuff off to them. No, I mean, hey, speaking of which, I suck at packaging, <laughs> and supply chain suck. I'm horrible. My wife does that. And aside from my wife, like, I think we just married well. I think we're idiots, actually. Um, my, uh, we got to take some credit. Yeah, my, um, <laughs> but again, like staff, like you look at who you surround yourself with, and that's something we talked about in the podcast. Like you did it, 
we, we hustled. We got it to where we could. But if it wasn't for our team, if it wasn't for our family, our employees, we couldn't do this. We couldn't grow. Sooner or later, you got to hire someone better than you at something so you can go find something else to grow. An entrepreneur is like a seed. You start a seedling, it starts to grow. But in order to get that tree, that garden to grow fully, you need to give it fertilizer. You need to give it light. You need to give it all this attention. And that's something you, can, you can't do on your own. You need to have a team. There's only so much you can do on your own. So my advice, surround yourself. And as I brought this up earlier, Mike Rashid, level up. Surround yourself, even your friends. Get, this sounds so terrible. <laughs> Don't hang out with losers. Hang out with people who make you better, who challenge you, who are better than you. Don't be the best in your group. Make sure you're surrounded by people who you can learn from, who aren't just taking from you, who can actually give back. And that, that's how you, that is, in my opinion, one of the best ingredients for your recipe to get this going. I just, uh, in finishing up here a little bit, I, you know, Mark and I have shared some information with each other today, and it's been uh, fantastic. And what you'll find from like-minded individuals is that there's really, there's not a lot of things that I wouldn't tell him. You know, some, sometimes with business, you want to, you need to be a little private with certain things. Certain things are kind of like intellectual property to a certain extent. But when you meet people that are on a similar level to you, or maybe even more advanced than you, you don't usually have to worry as much because I'm not really concerned he's going to try to take over some sort of thing that I'm trying to do. And you get yourself, it's a really interesting thing because you get yourself to a point where you're just like, you know, I'm, I'm executing really well. I'm into what I'm doing. I'm not too concerned on who does what. However, uh, when you share information with somebody that is kind of a quote unquote loser, that person's not going to reciprocate back to you. They're not going to, they're not going to be able to, they're not going to be able to, uh, and also sometimes they use that information and, and become resentful of you. And so it's, it's just, it gets to be tough. But if I was hanging out with Mark and I said, dude, you won't believe it. Last, last month we made, boom. And I said some number. First thing out of his mouth to go, oh shit, like that's, Hell dude, yes. that's awesome. Or we were talking about a friend that bought a Lamborghini recently. And it's like, I got goosebumps just thinking about it because I know that they earned it. Like that's sweet. That's really, really cool. When you hang around with people that are um, just not executing in that way, they're not going to have the same feeling towards you talking about buying a Lambo. <laughs> they're going to be very upset. You know, I, was I was excited. Like I literally saw it. I'm like, there you go. You know what I mean? Like I like to see people succeeding. I want to see people. I want to see people make it. I want to see all you guys do something special. I want everybody here to buy a damn Lambo. I don't even have a Lambo, but one day, um, I want to see everyone succeed. Because there's a yeah. I mean, <laughs> we can't fit in it together though. That'd look weird. Um, but no, I'm, I want to see everyone here succeed, and that's why we do what we do. Look, I don't have to be on YouTube. I don't. I'll be fine without it, you know? Um, but I do it, my views aren't what they used to be, but I do it because those who watch it get something out of it and they learn something and it might motivate them. And that's why I post, a, I don't need to wake up and post a, a quote on Instagram, but people will be like, you know what? This quarantine, you know, I was so depressed, but you were so positive through the whole thing and I'm not gonna let it get me down, I'm gonna lose 30 pounds, or I'm gonna do this, or I'm gonna start a side business. And I kept encouraging everybody, and I did it yesterday. There's never been a better time in American history to make money. I mean, I hate to say it like this, but your competition's very low right now. Businesses have gone under, and that sucks. But you could be the next big thing. You can do it now. There's more of an opportunity than ever. I want to see every single one of you succeed, whether it's at getting your bench press goal or starting your business or getting that promotion or marrying your dream girl. I want to see y'all succeed. That's where we're at right now. That's where I'm at. I know his heart is there, and it's an honor to be standing here with you, brother. Yeah, thank you guys so much for listening. Really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> there's not one thing that I saw this weekend from Mark that is uh, – like overwhelming that comes from like genetics. Uh, he doesn't have some story that his parents gave him, you know, 150K to start a business. It, he's just been working. He's just been grinding. He found stuff that he enjoys. He found stuff that he likes. Kind of basically sounds like he's always been working really hard, which is cool. 
But when you start to have these disciplines, you're going you're gonna to start to be able, the more discipline you are, the more freedoms that you'll be able to have. You'll be able to earn your freedom through having a lot of strong disciplines. Because you, at some point, you'll be disciplined enough to even have financial freedom. And that sort of starts to open up the door for all kinds of stuff. If you can hire people to handle your social media, if you can hire people to handle your packaging, well, then maybe your marriage isn't as stressful. If you can hire people to uh, do your laundry, if you can hire people to do X, Y, and Z, some of these things that are added to our plate that make you more stressful, you can get to maybe just relax a little bit more. And so think about the point that you would love to get yourself to. Make that a target and work every single day as much as you can within reason uh, to be able to accomplish some of those things. It's been great uh, spending some time with you. We're going to finish off chess because we got we still got to get, I, I'm recovered, I could go now. We still got to get a little bit. <laughs> A little bit more, Jack. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thanks for everybody that uh, asked some questions. Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you all later.